today I thought we could talk about something just for fun that I was coding at home, right? So a, a, a quite a while ago now, I did a video on maze solving. And the only reason I did that really was I just thought that might be quite fun to do, right? So I wrote some maze code and quite a lot of people looked at the GitHub and had a go at the code themselves. And so we're doing something a bit like that today. Now this actually came about because my son came home, so my son is 10, came home from a maths class and what they were doing was they were trying to find all the different shapes you could make with different cubes. So kind of like Tetris shapes. How many of those are there, right? And they just had to basically try and brute force find them all. And then there's a question of like, well, you know, if you can now add one more cube, how many new shapes are there? And you've got to add more, one more cube to all of those, how many new shapes are there? And you know, uh, my son's teacher sort of absentmindedly said, well, I know your dad does some coding, maybe you can look into this. And one thing led to another, I lost hours of evening, and, and you know, it's a red flag to a bull when you ask me, like, could you just do this you know, coding thing? Like, well, obviously, yes. Um, so anyway, long story short, uh, that's what we're talking about today. Well, how do I generate all the possible combinations of cubes just for fun, right? And is there a formula here, or is it? There's no, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any kind of formula, right? You can imagine that if you have a sort of a, a straight one, and then you add a cube on this side, or you add a cube down here, that's the same shape, right? Because if you rotate it, it's the same, it just makes an L. So there is a little bit of thought behind this. It's actually quite why it's quite an interesting programming problem, I think. Is this in a 2D plane? No, so this is in 3D, right? I'm going to draw 2D on the page, because I think if I try and draw 3D, we're all going to have a bad time. Uh, but, but actually, it's the same exact problem, it's just that there's now an extra dimension. So my code is all 3D, but it's exactly the same problem in 2D. You can find a few people that have had a go at this before. And in fact, it turned out on Wikipedia that the most ever combinations of shapes are for 16 cubes, right? No one's ever documented computing more than that. Now, I have not managed to get to 16 cubes yet, but when I do, you can be sure I'll be editing the Wikipedia page and saying I did it, like 17 cubes. What I thought was interesting about this was I started programming it thinking this is gonna be quite trivial, right? And, and it wasn't desperately difficult, but actually there, some thought has to go into this, especially if you want to make it fast. Right? So I thought we'd just talk through what I did, and I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, and then maybe people want to have a mess around, see if they can improve my code, recode it in a different language, which is way faster, and, and so on and so forth, uh, and let's see you know, how far we get. What did you do it in uh, C Sharp? I, I did it in Python using NumPy, which is essentially a, lar a, a large array. It, it lets me do um, operations on arrays. Um, the reason I did this was because it was the quickest way to getting this running. Right? Python is much, much slower. Even with NumPy, you, you could speed this up a huge amount by using you know, C or Java or something like this. The first thing that was on my mind was, how do I represent one of these shapes in memory? So one option was that I read online was you could just have a list of coordinates. So you could say, okay, a three long would be naught, 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 one, naught, naught, two, naught, naught, or something like this, right? And you could have a coordinate system that did this, but you then got to write a load of code that transforms from coordinate systems to, you know, rotations and things. And I thought, well, that, that sounds difficult. So what I'll do is I'll just have a byte array that is, let's say, three by three by three, or two by two or whatever. And there's ones if there's a cube in that position, and it's naught if there's not a cube in that position, right? That's very easy for me to visualize in my head, so that's what I'm doing. So suppose I wanted to do an L shape, a Tetris L, you know, then you might have a two by three array. We're talking about n equals four, so, you know, and in 2D, and you might have a one here, a one here, a one here, and a one here. And actually, that's quite easy to do in, in, in NumPy. You can create a two-dimensional array. If you want to do this in 3D, you can create a three-dimensional array, which would obviously have something going back here, which may or may not have ones and zeros in other channels. Now, how do you then generate all of the possible combinations of this? Well, one, one option would be just to have a blank array and just randomly populate this with ones and see if you've ever seen that shape before. That's not a desperately efficient way of doing it because, for example, that is not a valid shape, right? Because these have to be connected. Diagonals are not allowed. So it has to be, you know, that, or that, or some, you know, some combination of ones that can actually connect together. One of the ideas that I was reading about, and I'll put all the links to all the resources I used as well in the, in, the, in the description, but one of the ideas was, why don't you build all the next set of shapes off the previous set of shapes, right? If you've got all the possible threes, you can just put some blocks on it and then create all the possible fours, and then you can create all the possible fives and so on. Now, it takes a little bit longer to do this because you always have to generate the previous set of shapes, but actually, 
in practice, generating the next set is always so much slower that it doesn't really make any difference. So suppose you were generating these, this four here and you wanted to know what are the next set of shapes I could build from this. What I do is I pad this array out. I haven't really thought this through, this drawing, but sort of worked. There are nice NumPy functions to do just this. Right? You don't have to do it by hand. This would be populated with zeros. And then I can say, well, okay, where are the possible places I could extend this to? Right? Well, one of them is here, 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 and here. Now, sometimes, depending on the shape, this will produce you a new shape that you've never seen before. So if I put one in here, you get a kind of Z or whatever that is. If you put one here, you get a kind of upside down T. So you can go through each of these and you could add one in and say, okay, have I seen that shape before? It gets a little bit more complicated because then you realize, well, hang on a minute, half of these shapes are always the same as the ones I've seen before. So suppose you had this shape here, which is let's say one, 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 right? and you put one in here, right? Now you've got a kind of T shape, whatever that shape is in Tetris. I don't know, I'm sure there's a name, right? But if you put one there, you've made the exact same shape, just rotated 180 degrees, right? Now, you could include those as two different shapes, but actually you shouldn't really, right? If you wanna know all the possible shapes, you have to be able to weed out all the repetitions. What counts as a rotation and what counts as a flip? I think you have to just try and visualize in your head, but obviously, if you can rotate around any axis, and it aligns up exactly, it's the same shape. That's the idea. So when I was coding this up, it was quite easy to write something that represented a cube, a polycube, is what these are called, as ones within a, a sea of zeros. And it was quite easy to write some code that said, okay, these are the next shapes, and it, let's loop through each of those. It get, becomes a bit more difficult when you want to say, have I ever seen this shape before, given that I don't know what rotation it was in last time I saw it. Right? That's when it becomes a real headache. And it's just, it's just the kind of thing where you think, oh, I can't be too difficult. And it's going to be really, really quick and efficient. And then you realize, actually, this, it isn't very easy to write really fast code that does that. Because ultimately, there are 24 possible rotations in 3D of this. And that's not, not so good. So. I, I did, I felt the first thing I did was a super lazy version. So what I did was I just had a huge list of all the shapes I'd seen. When a new shape came along, I rotated it in all possible directions and then looked through the whole list, right? And those of you watching and wincing a little bit at the, at the efficiency of that, you'd be absolutely right to do so, right? It was shockingly slow. Um, I managed to produce, I think, up to all the eights and nines before my laptop said, no, nah, I'm not, not gonna go any further than that unless you wanna wait half a year. So then I had another thought, but think about this. And I thought, well, one of the ways that you can improve the speed of lookup is to use something that, like a hash table, right? Or in, in Python, a set, which allows you to find very, very quickly whether something is already in there. As I mentioned, one way in 2D, if you've got a new possible shape, which is let's say this shape here, and right? you want to know if this shape has already been seen before, and you've got a huge long list of all the other shapes, one of which might be that or that, you know, and some other rotation, then in 2D, what you would have to do is rotate this four times and then for each of those four, look for all your shapes. And that's really, really slow. Right? Um, in 3D, it's 24 times, it's even worse. Is, it, is there any benefit in sort of storing each unique one you found in those 24 ways and then when you're looking something up, you're just looking through 24 times the data or is that just the same problem reversed? It, it, yeah, you end up, at some point, you have to calculate all 24 rotations. And then what you're doing is you're trading off the lookup speed for the memory you've used and, and so on. I think, you know, this is what I quite like about this problem, actually, is that you think, oh, this can't be that hard. And then you realise this is a bit of a memory mess and this is taking quite a long time to solve. And apparently, the world record for this is, number, is n equals 16. And I'm not even close to n equals 16. My, my, my laptop's maxing out at n equals 9. This is an embarrassment, right? I need to do something about this. So... What, what I did was I, I decided, okay, so the first thing to do is, what is the fastest way we can compare this at each rotation to all others? Now, one nice thing is that in NumPy, when you rotate an array, you don't actually have to rotate it in memory. You just look it up in a different way, right? So depending, if these are all pixels, you could imagine that if you looked in this order, or you looked in this order, or in this order, that's equivalent to rotating that shape. And so actually you can do this quite elegantly. So in some sense, the rotations isn't actually such a big deal. It's the lookup. Right? If you're looking through a list, then the problem you have is to find this element, you have to compare it to every single element in the list. 
that's going to get very slow very quickly. If you've got one element in the list, it's one check. If you've got 10,000 elements in the list, it's going to be 10,000 checks, right? You don't want to do this. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to find some way of converting this shape into a simple hash numerical code, and we can just look up if the code's in there. And that can be done much more quickly, because often you avoid any collisions, you just jump straight to the right place, and you say, nope, not, not been seen before. Now, hash functions don't work well with objects that can change, right? Mutable objects where this can change and change shape and be different shapes, that's hard to hash. So what I was trying to do was find a way of representing this in memory in a really concise way that also didn't change and so I could hash it really quickly. So I came up with my kind of Mike Pound special run length encoding scheme which is never going to be used again and it's terrible but I thought it would work. So what I do is I store a list of integers that represent this. So first of all, I flatten it, and that means basically take this and just lay it all out in one row. And then I store the x, the y, and the z size, or x and y if it's 2D, x, y, z if it's 3D. And then for any string of zeros, so this would be one, two, three, four, five zeros before you get to the next one, I'm going to restore a minus five. And then for any string of, uh, of ones, I'm going to store a positive number. So that would be one. Then it would be 1, 2, 3, minus 3. Then another, uh, that's 2 actually, right? It's kind of worked, I can't believe it. Uh, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 5. Now, th is this the perfect way of storing these shapes? Probably not, right? This is what I came up with while I was sitting in front of the TV. If anyone can beat me, then please do. What, you know. what were you watching? <laughs> there were no helpful programs on how to do this. That, that was disappointing. So, now that I've got this, I can fix this in memory and then I can hash it and that can be stored in our set and that allows our lookup to be much faster. Right? So now, essentially, we're not having to look through 10,000 objects every time. We have to convert it into this run length encoding format. Then we hash that, which is automatic in Python. I, I like when it does things for me and I don't have to do it myself. And then we can quickly look it up in a set and say, is it in there? If not, we can store a new one. Right? And, then, and that's really all my code does, right? So if you download my code on GitHub, you can see what it does. It, sen it essentially takes as a command line parameter a number of polycubes to use, right? So n equals 10 would mean you're generating all the combinations of 10. So what it first does is generate all the combinations of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If it's already seen them before and saved them to a file, it will just load that file nice and quickly. And then... Um, and then it starts generating each 10. And actually, I, I think I've generated up to 11 or 12 now. Right? And, and it's getting a bit slow and I got a bit bored. So I, I, I stopped. Right? And I thought, you know, I've got to give someone else some work to do. Um, but th there are lots of ways you could improve it. So first of all, Python is quite slow. Right? I mean, Python is fine. And, and, and I've tried to use NumPy libraries to do this most of the time, partly because it's easier for me to program and partly because that drops down into C quite quickly and it's much faster than if you're doing lots of loops in Python. But multi-threading this, doing it in a language which is fast by design would be better, right? And it might be more memory efficient because I've made use of some sort of slightly lazy NumPy libraries to find the bounds of objects and rotate all the objects and stuff. There might be better ways of doing this. Um, the key if you really wanted to produce many, many of these is that you would need to find some way of encoding this which accounts for rotation. And I haven't thought of one yet. Right. And everyone else I've asked has gone, well, that must be easy. And they've wandered off and come back with a bit of a headache and not worked out how to do it. Part of my code crops them down to the minimum bounds first, because that's not the true shape of the object. That's also slow and also annoying that I had to do that. But, you know, there are loads of efficiency savings you could make. I kind of gave up and thought, well, this is good enough. What I'll do is I'll put it on the Internet and let someone else fix it for me. Um, but it's, it's a fun little project. If you want to have a go at it, you can generate loads of different cubes. You can actually render them on the screen and then um, have a look at them, right? Now, up to about n equals eight, at which point, you know, the graphing library doesn't help, doesn't thank you for trying to generate that many cubes. Um, but I thought it was a really fun problem, which was just a little bit more difficult than I thought it would be. And it's one of those nice problems where it's difficult enough and it's a fun challenge, but you can actually do it. Just thinking about it, could you load this into something like Beast and get the GPUs going? Yeah, so, I mean, that is sort of on my mind, is that if I could implement this in a multi-threaded way using a different language, Python doesn't handle threading very well. Um, but if I could do that, I could run it on one of these 100 core machines and to see what happened. Right? Um, and maybe I'll have a go at that record.
and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and get yourself into a loop. Or here we've actually got an actual loop. We might just go round and round. Another if we don't have any idea about where we do. is so I twelve array, mod seven exactly is five. Is right. Five times five is twenty-five. But the next multiple 